As we mentioned, one of the hardest hit areas from last night's storm was Hamden. And Toby Moffat is there right now with a live report on how the cleanup effort is progressing. Toby? Joanne, it was indeed one of the worst hit places. And most of what you hear around City Hall, which is right over here next to me today, is the word lucky. They may, in fact, have to rename Hamden the nation's luckiest city after what happened here last night. Now, at a 5 o'clock news conference that concluded just recently here at City Hall, Mayor Carasone said, he said it over and over again, given the extent of the destruction, it was a miracle that we didn't have more people hurt and many people killed. Now, they seem to be touching all the necessary bases here in Hamden. The mayor has talked at length with Governor O'Neill. Uh, Bruce Morris and the congressman has, in fact, talked to the vice president, Vice President Quayle, today. And they're expecting a considerable amount of aid from the Federal Emergency Management Administration, which has a cleanup fund uh, that's pretty well stocked with cash. The mayor also just told me that the damage here is well over $50 million, in his view. He doesn't see a major long-term effect. There may be some kids who get an early taste of college, however, because they may have to rent some space from Southern Connecticut State University if a middle school is not completed in terms of the repair damage. Now, as far as today, Tom Monahan took a look at how hard hit Hamden really was and what they're doing to recover from it. The people here say the height of the the people here say the height of the storm lasted only two and a half minutes, but the destruction is still difficult to comprehend. Businesses like this one were totally demolished. Three people were trapped under tons of wreckage in the basement of what had been their home. Miraculously, they survived. And there are stories of trees uprooted, of live power lines draped through trees and along sidewalks and roads, and of pieces of aluminum siding scattered about like shrapnel. Numerous injuries have been reported, but it appears that at least in this area of Connecticut, there are no fatalities. However, fire officials and police dogs are making sure that's the case. Many of the streets are still blocked. You know, the, the trees are down, the, the power lines are down, and you can't get to certain areas. Throughout the day, residents of this badly hit five-block area were trying to assess their damages and to do what they could to make repairs. One woman lost the roof of her house. Luckily, ran down into the basement, and then we heard this big crash. All the windows came in. When we came upstairs to assess the damage, I noticed that stuff from upstairs was in the living room, so we walked upstairs, and the roof was gone. Others were trying to pack up what belongings were salvageable to take with them, knowing full well it'll be some time before they can return to their homes. The house is finished, the furniture, the clothes. I'm just trying to get what I can get now. I've been through different hurricanes, you know, that we've had, and this is the worst I've ever seen. Meanwhile, officials say there was some minor looting last night, but nothing serious. So as the workers peel back the debris and people continue to dig out, it could in fact be that someone did die in this storm in Hamden. But as it stands right now, it appears the people in this neighborhood survived. In Hamden, Tom Onahan, Connecticut News Today. Now, as far as where this storm came from and how it ripped through the state, I guess if you wanted to take the fastest route from Sharon up in the northwest corner down to New Haven and East Haven, you'd follow the path of this storm. Brad Field joins us now with more on that. Okay, Toby, of course, uh, you and Tom reporting from Hamden, the area of the most devastation. But I'm going to take you through the mid and late afternoons yesterday and step you through what happened as we go to our graphic system. The storm system entered the state at around 3 p.m. yesterday up toward the Sharon, Lakeville, Cornwall area. And there was a possible tornado up there. And also homes set afire by lightning strikes. This storm was characterized by lightning, the tornado winds, and of course up to baseball-size hail as the storm continued to track south east through Litchfield and then on down toward Waterbury, Middlebury, Watertown. Then the storm continued to track southeast to where Toby is uh, tonight down in the area of Hamden and New Haven before the storm finally exited out to sea through Long Island Sound. Now earlier today I was doing extensive uh, research on the meteorology of tornadoes and I'll have a full report on that coming up later. I think you'll find it interesting but now let's go back to Joanne. All right, Brad, thanks. And Waterbury was the city that suffered the next heaviest amount of damage after Hamden. Harlan Levy's live there with a report on the latest. Harlan? Joanne, uh, the count here in Waterbury is 27,000 Northeast Utilities customers are still without power because of the storm, which it was very obvious today, blew right through here with sound and fury. Now, Governor O'Neill viewed uh, most of the wreckage firsthand when his tour touched down here this morning.
The governor and Senator Dodd arrived in Waterbury at 11 this morning. They were met by Mayor Joseph Santapetro and the trio headed out by motorcade for a tour of the most seriously damaged areas of the city. The storm took its heaviest toll in the hills where it cut a wide swath, uprooting trees and utility poles and knocking out power along the way. At the worst, 40,000 customers in around 200 locations were in the dark in Greater Waterbury. Damage estimates go into the millions. You think there will be federal aid? I think so. Uh, Waterbury would certainly uh, be in the category of a, of a city that would need assistance and probably get it. More than 60 people were treated at area hospitals for storm-related injuries. Waterbury Hospital admitted two of the four girls hit by a tree in the Thomaston camp. 69-year-old Angelo Antico of Waterbury suffered a heart attack and died. 20 others were treated. St. Mary's Hospital treated 40 people. Three were admitted. Cars and houses in Waterbury's historic Overlook neighborhood suffered perhaps the most extensive damage. Real estate developer Dave O'Leary had just driven home in his $28,000 Volvo bearing gifts for his wife for their seventh anniversary yesterday. I just had parked the car last night, walked in the house, and the tree fell on it one minute later. I'm told that I have insurance for the car. And we have homeowner's insurance, which will cover the damage to the house. Uh, I guess cleanup is on our own. We're thankful no one was hurt. Everything else can be replaced in time. Around the corner, Jack Small was making a lamb chop supper when the electric stove shut down. And all of a sudden, I heard a bang. I said, well, something got hit. And sure enough, later on, I came out and I found my tree down against the, uh, the house. And that, that was it. Joanne, the uh, lesson here is perhaps obvious, but it's that anything can happen, and if you don't have insurance, you better be prepared to pay the price. As far as the power outages are concerned, crews from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire will be working through the night to try to get it all back on by around midnight, they hope. Back to you, Joanne. All right, Harlan. I think uh, Waterbury is one of the hardest hit efforts, uh, areas for uh, electrical out uh, outages, so we'll keep you posted on that. We're going to go back to Toby Moffat in Hamden in just a little bit. Our coverage of recovery efforts and cleanup will continue right after the break. And we'll also report on a near miracle in the Litchfield area, the first town to be hit by the storm. Back here, Toby Moffat back here live at the Hamden City Hall where the mayor's just held a press conference uh, laying out what their plans are. They are, by the way, going to be taking a tour through a neighborhood here in Hamden very soon, the hardest hit neighborhood. And if they find that there are people in homes that are structurally unsafe, they're going to kick them out of there. We'll be along on that tour when it happens. Now, last night, uh, I had the opportunity to go to New Haven right after the storm. And again, the word is miracle, a miracle that not more people were injured and killed. The devastation was unbelievable, and it left only four people hospitalized. Uh, one four-year-old boy, however, in critical condition after apparently being blown by high winds from an apartment window. Ross Joel was in New Haven today, and he has this report. The cleanup has been brutally slow in New Haven. Bassett Street in the New Hallville section finally started getting attention about 11 this morning, 17 hours after the vicious storm slashed through town. Crews are doing their best to open up streets choking with debris, but it's a tedious process. A lot of trees down, a lot of limbs down, a lot of lines down, and uh, it's been a real job for us. In fact, downed trees are forming natural barricades throughout the northern part of the city. Power lines dangle everywhere in tattered strands, having left thousands without service. And there's the tangle of wreckage and metal carcasses left by the marauding storm. Today, many people remain stunned, not ready to face the damage to their homes and with vivid images of the storm. When the wind blew, you could feel the house like go back and forth like that. It's kind of scary. It happened so suddenly. See the damage it did. How, how, it much, just, how much damage do you think you have? Oh, at least few thousand dollars worth. There's the trees in the backyard are smashed and totaled out the garage in the back. In addition to the cleanup, one of the biggest challenges facing authority is simply moving people around the city. Authorities are at virtually every intersection trying to ease the snarl of confusion. Camden's blocked off are trying to get directed, directed around the city and to their homes and their, to their loved ones. At this point, it's estimated cleanup will take three to five days. It's clear order won't arrive here as quickly as the storm did. In New Haven, Ross Joel, Connecticut News Today. Now from here in Hamden and neighboring New, New Haven, back up to where the storm entered the state in Litchfield County, the story was very much the same. Lisa Jones was in Litch, Litchfield County for us today, and she found that it was a miracle that more people there weren't hurt. The flattened and roofless buildings and splintered trees were enough to tell anyone who happened through Bantam today that a tornado touched down here last night. 
but you had to talk to the people in this tiny community to learn about what they're calling a series of miracles that hit about the same time. There's the miracle that winds strong enough to hurl this slate shingle tomahawk style into a tree didn't hurt or injure anyone in its path. That's three inches in there. And the Perone family is alive and well and tells of a few miracles of their own. I was standing by the front door before he knew what happened. I, I couldn't move because of the glass flying through the house. So I just stood there and said, please don't suck me out because it was trying to pull me out the front door. Their front porch is gone and they lost part of their roof, but the house fared well compared to the historic Bantam Town Hall just 20 yards away. The First Methodist Church here in Bantam has withstood nearly a century's worth of inclement weather, but last night's storm was more than this old structure could tolerate. It was reduced to this pile of rubble within a matter of moments. But congregation members at this church are still counting their blessings that the twister came through when it did. A few hours later and churchgoers gathered for a scheduled meeting might have been trapped inside. No one was in Ed Pohl's gas station last night either. For the first time in 21 years, he had shut the place down yesterday to change underground tanks. And it was a fire a few months back that had temporarily closed this restaurant so that it wasn't filled with people when last night's tornado ripped off the roof. No one was injured? No one. Remarkable. Litchfield's first select woman, Linda Bongiolotti, pointed out to Governor O'Neill the devastation that's left more than a dozen families homeless here, with the houses of nearly 50 more suffering some sort of damage. It'll take weeks of work before things even begin to get back to normal. But after what they've been through, most of the residents here say they just feel lucky to be alive. In Bantam, Lisa Jones, Connecticut News Today. And from the Hamden Town Hall here, back to you, Joanne. All right, Toby, you have to be impressed with the destructive uh, force of this storm. It's amazing. Coming up next, we do have other news for you today, and we'll have the... Thanks, Beans. <laughs> Let's go back and recap now our top story of the day, the storm damage and the storm recovery. Toby Moffat joins us live again from Hamden. Toby. Okay, I still want to be a sportscaster. Maybe it'll happen someday. But right here at the Hamden Town Hall, uh, as I indicated earlier, our, our top story here, the mayor had a press conference. They're going out. They're looking at homes in areas that were hardest hit. Uh, we're not going to kick people out, but they're going to ask them to leave and, and ultimately order them to leave if they find out structurally there are problems. So we'll have more on that coming up later. All right, and that is uh, Connecticut News Today. Thanks for joining us. For Toby Moffat in Hamden, Brad Field and Beasley Reese here, I'm Joanne Nesting. NBC Nightly News is coming up next, and Anthony Everett and I will see you at 11 for Connecticut News tonight, or I should say right after the All-Star Game. Enjoy it. The evidence will remain for a while to remind visitors how the storm struck the Mohawk Mountain ski area with full force. Thousands of trees were cut down, some remained twisted every which way. Heavy winds tore the roof off the base lodge, destroyed several buildings, and decimated lifts and towers. Mohawk's owners today started toting up the damage, which early estimates place at two to three million dollars. There's very little here that, that hasn't taken uh, uh, hits from the storm. All of the buildings are destroyed in some manner or another, as are all of, of the chairlifts. Those are man-made things, though, and they can be replaced. Because of all the damage, there's now a good chance Mohawk will not be able to open Thanksgiving weekend the way it usually does. But because this is a major state tourist attraction and some 300 seasonal workers depend on it, state officials arrived here today intending to help out. To get a salvage job, to get all the dead trees off the hillside as soon as possible. Over and above that, maybe we can expedite the flow of paperwork to, to give, get these people some federal aid. Meanwhile, a full mile from Mohawk Mountain all along Route 4 into the village of Cornwall, you could see cleanup crews clearing away debris. The storm cut an obvious path through town, but most of the houses, including the Cornwall Post Office, were spared. Dozens of trees that surround it were not. Frank Bailey and his wife watched the storm rip right through their neighborhood. I saw it snap the trees off on the other side. I saw the maple tree come down beside the house. And uh, then I looked out back and I couldn't believe it. Then we went for a walk. <laughs> 
One sight Bailey and his neighbors saw was the completely devastated stand of 200-year-old white pines up the road. These little pines are gone, and that's a shame. They were beautiful. Harlan Levy, Connecticut News Today. Ever. Thank you.